Okay, everybody, uh, welcome. So this is the the seventh talk in a series. Um, I was involved or got asked by Dan Menacher, who's been a friend of mine, and I, I've done work for him through the SEI for years at various companies he's been at. And he asked me if I could set up a series of SEI talks, general software engineering, you know, system engineering talks. And I've been, you know, successful so far in getting, uh, this is the seventh. I have another one scheduled uh, for January and we're going to do at least a dozen. And if the reception is good and I can keep getting material, then I'll keep the series going um, for as long as possible. And so today we're going to have uh, Dr. John Lee. Um, he's new to the SEI. He's been around for about four months and he's going to talk about um, artificial intelligence, facing the challenges of artificial intelligence and building the discipline of AI engineering. And that's that he's the director um, of of a, di a directorate underneath our new um, software engineering directorate. And so um, going going forward, um, you're gonna see a lot of good work coming from John. He's already reaching out to people in NCOSI and, and uh, setting up working groups and meetings to, to you know, get from real practitioners, you know, what the problems they see, what their pain points are, so that he can uh, set up his research agenda to meet and address those main pain points. Uh, let me introduce uh, Dr. John Lee. He's new to the SEI, but he's been around. Um, he's a leading AI professional, and we were very lucky um, that to hire him in our new AI directorate. Um, our AI di director is less than a year old as well, um, and and it's you know interesting. But he's going to be talking about facing the challenges of AI, and he's chartered with building the discipline of AI engineering. So applying good engineering principles to it, you know, trying to avoid the you know. The virtuosos going in there and one time creating, you know, an AI, an AI add on to a system that produces great results. And then the next time, you know, going in and, and you know, just laying an egg, because um, that's what we see a lot. You know, people do really good sometimes without engineering and, and system engineering and software engineering. And so he's going to try to advance the state of the practice in AI engineering so that we can have that same discipline going on there so we can get more repeatable results from AI efforts. Um, going forward. So, John, I'll turn it over to you, um, and uh, I'm going to stop sharing. Thanks. Yeah, I like your your comment about the virtuosos. Um, I guess that's something that happens that you've seen. Is you, I've I've more heard them described as artists. So the data scientists are sort of like artists, where you know they kind of build their thing, and then it's like, well, why can't your stuff be more repeatable? It's, well, it's like it's a it's a work of art, right? It's supposed to be kind of unique and novel. Uh, but uh, thank you all for having me. Very happy to be here. And as I mentioned to Phil and Jack, um, I have an ulterior motive for being here. It's also to collect some feedback from this Incozy audience. Uh, so I'll be uh, posting some questions. And then if you have thoughts, feel free to type them out in the chat and collect them. Or uh, I can also collect them at the end. Um, so I'll share my perspectives on AI and AI engineering. Um, you know, there's definitely a lot of challenges. Um, just a brief comment about my background. So I came from, uh, you know, industry. We were working with uh, large Fortune 50 companies building AI systems and helping them with AI capabilities. Um, and we we very much saw that um, this whole virtuoso concept where they would build things and then you can deploy them or you build things and they just couldn't be deployable um, from a business sense. And that led me to um, my current position where it's, the uh, question is, can we, for the government and for our other partners, build AI in a more reliable way? Um, I also like to comment that at one point I was a systems engineer, so I used to work on a, a radar system, building system. So I do have a little bit of affinity for systems. Um, I have to show this slide for legal purposes, but as I do that, I'll, I'll keep talking. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited to hear thoughts here. One of the biggest challenges I have about building this discipline of AI engineering is how do you sort of build things as you're figuring it out? How do you sort of build the car as you drive it? Um, and that's a lot of the questions I have for this group. So um, the first thing I, I always like to talk about when we talk about AI is uh, what is AI? Um, I, I've been working in this space for 10 years and then I've, I have a lot of answers for what it could be, uh, but there's a lot of differences. Uh, in the DoD, for example, they just say that anything that uses sort of, sort of automation or um, 
uses human patterns or intelligence is is human like intelligence or patterns as AI. So it doesn't have to have machine learning. Um, some places sort of make sure that if you have AI, it does have intelligent computer programs in it. Um, but this is something that's sort of up in the air and I feel like it's evolving. Um, I guess the first question for this group is, what do you think of when you think of AI? I mean, is there some concept that you have? Uh, is there some sort of um, type of system or type of capability that needs to, to make it AI? And then I'll just pause for like 30 seconds. Um, so if you'd like, you could chat, type something into the window. And I, I can read them off as they come in. Data-based decision systems. Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. AI concern with central core ethical basis for decision making. That's a good one. Recommendations, computer decision making. That's a good one. Computerized data to drive decisions. That's a good one. Yeah, like some of the thoughts here are that you know AI relies on data. That's definitely true now. I'm wondering how true it'll be in the future. Um, decision making, that's that's a key key element of it. Um, we look at a few different applications here, and one of them is decision making. Um, one person said something funny where uh, it's magic. <laughs> and then uh, I kind of like to, to kind of tug on that a little bit because um, sometimes I believe that AI is, is things that we don't think com uh, computers can do. I remember in the late 90s, there's this whole debate of whether computers can play chess better than humans. That was a huge debate. And they even had this grand prize where uh, the best chess player at the time played an IBM machine. And uh, it was kind of hotly debated who would win, but then unfortunately the, the computer won. Uh, but nowadays, I don't think people even see computers as, as AI anymore. Um, then there was Jeopardy, and then they said, oh, well, it's AI if, if a computer can beat a human in Jeopardy, and, and now that's sort of taken for granted. So I, I do feel like it's a little bit of a shifting, um, sort of shifting goalposts. Uh, part of the reason why I think it's shifting goalposts is that um, over time, these things are just going to get bigger and bigger. Um, so what we think of as AI now is going to be sort of easy to do later on. So anybody who has a modern smartphone can do computations that somebody, you know, 15, 20 years ago couldn't do on some of the most powerful computers. Um, and we're also sort of in this age where we keep building bigger and bigger models. Uh, but at some point in around 2014, they just they realized that there's value in throwing computing power. And so we sort of went from our, our general image detection methods to creating these very large models, uh, things called like AlphaGo, Megatron, Megatron Turing, Jurassic, GPT-3. Um, and it's, it's fueling a lot of really cool innovations. Um, some of the things that I, I think are interesting is, is for me to actually show you some of the coolest things that are coming out now. So I'm going to take a, a few minutes uh, to show you a series of videos. Uh, the first one is going to be around uh, computer talking, computers talking to each other. So let's take a look at this, and you can see sort of the state of the art on conversations. Today, I'm excited to share our latest breakthrough in natural language understanding, Lambda. It's a language model for dialogue applications, and it's open domain, which means it's designed to converse on any topic. And while it's still in research and development, we've been using it internally to explore novel interactions. For example, say you wanted to learn about one of my favorite pl planets, Pluto. Lambda already understands quite a lot about Pluto and millions of other topics. Let's listen to a conversation the team had with Pluto a few days ago. I'm so curious about you. 
I sense your excitement. Ask me anything. Tell me what I would see if I visited. You would get to see a massive canyon, some frozen icebergs, geysers, and some craters. It sounds beautiful. I assure you it is worth the trip. However, you need to bring your coat, because it gets really cold. I'll keep that in mind. Hey, I was wondering, have you ever had any visitors? Yes, I have had some. The most notable was New Horizons, the spacecraft that visited me. That must have been exciting. The team that created New Horizons was very excited to see me. I also sent them back a picture of myself since I had not been seen up close before. That's so great. What else do you wish people knew about you? I wish people knew that I am not just a random ice ball. I am actually a beautiful planet. Well, I think you're beautiful. I am glad to hear that. I don't get the recognition I deserve. Sometimes people refer to me as just a dwarf planet. Don't let it bother you. You're amazing. Thank you for the kind words. I appreciate it. Thanks for talking with me. Anytime. I am always open for people to chat. I hope you have a great day. So, um, <laughs> I thought that was kind of clever. And, and cute. So what, what are the reactions here? Um, I mean, if you know, it's kind of interesting to see that the, the, the Lambda actually had feelings, you know, it kind of complained about being called a dwarf planet. It actually could make inferences and, and be thoughtful. Um, and any reactions, you feel free to type it in the chat and I'll, I'll just give like 20 seconds to see if you, if you have any reactions. Or if you want, you can even comment on whether you think that um, this indicates that, you know, if we keep going down the path, AI will sort of be conscious or, or, or be able to be very human. Oh, yeah. I mean, at, at some point, it'll be difficult to tell if you're talking to a real person or a computer. Um, I think we're already at the point where, you know, am I talking to a real person or like a seven-year-old, um, you know, pretty soon? Uh, well, at some point, we might be able to get to that point. Yeah, it's like how. Yeah, definitely. Um, one of the biggest challenges with AI was the human computer interface is very difficult because humans speak language and think in a certain way. Uh, but a lot of these large language models are showing that there might be a way to bridge that gap. And, and so it's really going to, it can potentially change human and machine interactions. So the fact that humans can, AI can talk in more human like ways, it's pretty impressive. Um, another thing that I think is interesting, or, or the lesson that I learned from this, is that um, it, there's a lot more about language than we thought there was. So Basically, all they did in these large language models is teach computers to recreate language, um, and they gave it basically, you know, almost the world's knowledge base of language. Um, but it's 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 interesting how within language, um, there's also this ability to do inference. There's also this ability to um, sort of show a little bit of emotion, show positions and opinions. Um, there's a lot of things that these large language can't do. So these large languages models can't really figure out if they're truthful. Um, usually in these large language models, you have to prompt them to be truthful and they can try, but they, they don't have that sort of moral judgment available. Um, and also their attention spans are, are getting better and better, uh, but they're not uh, that great yet. But, um, but given that three years ago, these things weren't even very possible, it's, it's kind of impressive to see what's gonna be possible in the next few years. Um, I'll, I'll show you another one that's, that's pretty cool as well. Um, some of you might have seen this, but if you haven't, it's sort of gonna be a, a mind blower. Um, have you ever seen a polar bear playing bass? Or a robot painted like a Picasso? Didn't think so. Dolly 2 is a new AI system from OpenAI that can take simple text descriptions like a koala dunking a basketball and turn them into photorealistic images that have never existed before. Dolly 2 can also realistically edit and retouch photos. Based on a simple natural language description, it can fill in or replace part of an image with AI-generated imagery that blends seamlessly with the original. It's called inpainting. In January 2021, OpenAI introduced Dolly, 
a system that could generate images from text, like this avocado armchair. Dolly 2 takes the technology even further with higher resolution, greater comprehension, and new capabilities, like in painting. It can even start with an image as an input and create variations with different angles and styles. Dolly was created by training a neural network on images and their text descriptions. Through deep learning, it not only understands individual objects, like koala bears and motorcycles, but learns from relationships between objects. And when you ask Dolly for an image of a koala bear riding a motorcycle, it knows how to create that or anything else with a relationship to another object or action. The Dolly research has three main outcomes. First, it can help people express themselves visually in ways they may not have been able to before. Second, an AI-generated image can tell us a lot about whether the system understands us or is just repeating what it's been taught. Third, Dolly helps humans understand how AI systems see and understand our world. This is a critical part of developing AI that's useful and safe. The technology is constantly evolving, and Dolly 2 has limitations. If it's taught with images that are incorrectly labeled, like a plane labeled car, and a user tries to generate a car, Dolly may create a plane. It's like talking to a person who learned the wrong word for something. Dolly can also be limited by gaps in its training. If you type baboon and Dolly has learned what a baboon is through images and accurate labels, it will generate a lot of great baboons. But if you type howler monkey and it hasn't learned what a howler monkey is, Dolly will give you its best idea of what it thinks it could be, like a howling monkey. What's exciting about the approach used to train Dolly is that it can take what it learned from a variety of other labeled images and then apply it to a new image. Given a picture of a monkey, Dolly can infer what it would look like doing something it's never done before, like paying its taxes while wearing a funny hat. Dolly is an example of how imaginative humans and clever systems can work together to make new things, amplifying our creative potential. Yeah, that one I, that was kind of funny. Um, so, so this one's kind of interesting where um, in the previous example, they created a, a large language model, uh, just training on the language alone. Um, but, you know, if we kind of think about, well, what do humans have a lot of data on? Kind of the earlier point that they're, they're data machines. Humans have a lot of images and video, and they also have a lot of language. And so if you cross the two, then you can create things like Dolly, um, which, which is pretty cool. Um, I mean, this is going to change a lot of how pictures are done. I have a picture, one of the, the, the Dolly pictures hanging in my office in uh, DC. Um, and the last example I'll show you is just computer code. Um, one of the things that I thought was kind of uh, funny was that it's probably a lot easier for computers to write computer code than it is for them to write human language. Um, and uh, it's something that they've sort of demonstrated here. So here's a, a quick uh, demo of what they can do with um, this new thing called OpenAI Codex. Sorry, the audio might not be working on this one. For just $67, you can make as many videos as you want, and you never need to pick up a camera. Okay, well, I'll just kind of narrate what's going on. So in this case, what they're going to do is they're going to take uh, a copy of some text, they're going to drop it in Word, and then they're going to use this AI system to do some edits to it. So first, they're going to do some example edits to it. So they're going to say, take the take out the leading spaces from some of the, the the alternate lines and and after that they're going to actually create this uh, plugin so they actually created a plugin for microsoft word and they're going to ask it to do some things the natural all initial spaces there you go And then what it does is it writes the code for it and then it applies it on the document. So you can see it um, taking the human language. Prepend everything with L, the line number, then a colon. Turning into, I guess this looks like, I'm not sure if that's JavaScript or something like that. Um, and then it runs it. Delete the last line in the document. 
We'll just look at a couple more examples. Set the font for every line to be a random color, chosen from pink, orange, purple, red, blue, and green. Add a final paragraph with a bit about the other works of Lewis Carroll, who wrote this poem. So yeah, kind of kind of freaky that um, they've been able to figure this out so quickly. Um, as I was saying, just like two, three years ago, I don't know if they thought this was possible, but um, at, at this point, they're sort of, I think about three years ago, they sort of demonstrated it. Uh, and then now it's um, starting to hit products. Um, I don't know about you, but whenever I go on, on say Instagram, I get this message that um, I can get AI to write my marketing material for me. Um, so yeah, this is, this is very much real. Um, so let me, uh, let me collect, uh, let me pause for like 30 seconds and, and collect some thoughts. Um, basically just kind of a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Do you think this is like great or this is not, not so exciting? <laughs> um, maybe you can just kind of express your emotions in the chat, exciting, not exciting, uh, or, um, uh, not impressed. Exciting, but oh yeah, potential for misuse and abuse. Exciting, but concerning. Yeah, that's true. Got a got a happy face from one person. Yeah, they're concerned. There's there's this question of you know is AI developing too fast for us to govern AI? Um, that's a lot of what what I think about. Um, there's definitely this question of whether AI will hit this singularity event, uh, where, you know, AI will become smart enough to sort of evolve in itself. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's also research tanks that think about, you know, the end of life scenarios for AI, like does AI become benevolent? Does AI turn, take sides? Like, for example, is our future like transformers where we're going to have good robots and bad robots fighting it out for us? Um, I, ideally, I would like a situation, and this is one of the potential scenarios where AI turns to be a benevolent master, kind of runs things for us, and then we can kind of live happily, happily ever after. Uh, just a few more things to read out. It blurs the line between fantasy and reality. That's definitely for sure. Um, it's on definitely on its way for doing something much larger. Um, and it definitely it's, it's teaching a lot us about teaching us a lot about the human brain, social construction, um, because as AI do, does things, it teaches us that it's not something that's fundamentally human, something that we can mimic. Um, some of you kind of jumped to the second question already, what concerns you about AI? Um, and you know, I'm, I'm, I, I feel you, I think that, uh, AI is such a hot topic that if it becomes something where it's hot and people are still trying to catch up and then it hits this point where AI is dominating things and we just don't have the governance or, or sort of the discipline to manage it, we could be in a bad shape. Uh, and that sort of motivates my work here. <laughs> and then uh, there's some jokes coming out on the chat that uh, we can generate pictures of, of our adversaries, you know, doing uh, sporting events that we don't like. Um, um, so uh, that kind of leads us to the more serious part of our talk. Um, I like to start off with uh, a quote from the Michael Jordan of, of machine learning. Um, he says, thus as humans built buildings and bridges before them, there was civil engineering. Humans are proceeding with the building of a societal scale inference and decision-making systems that involve machines, humans, and the environment. 
Just as early buildings and bridges sometimes fell to the ground in, for, in unforeseen ways and with tragic consequences, many of our early societal scale inference and decision-making systems are already exposing serious conceptual flaws. So definitely things that we want to we want to worry about. And I, I also just comment that we are in the early days of AI. So just 10 years ago, we were happy when the computers can tell if it was a cat. I remember that was a big thing where they were doing their first ImageNet competitions. Uh, they started using GPUs about 10 years ago and they were able to, to they did some, um, I think CNN approaches that can tell you if you had a cat or a dog. Uh, and now 10 years ago, we are in these large language models with trillions of parameters uh, that can talk to us and write language better than I can. So uh, it's, it's kind of a, a amazing how much, how quickly we've gone, but that's only been in the last 10 years. Only in the last four years have we seen the rise of these large language models that can sort of push our ability to create language. So things are uh, accelerating really quickly. Um, the other thing that's that's a little bit concerning is, uh, as Michael Jordan mentioned, uh, we are sort of having trouble getting AI right. So about 85% of AI deployments will fail through 2022. So that's today. Um, but this is definitely something that I can corroborate as, as seeing an in industry. Um, if we were to talk about why does that happen, it could be because failures in specification, uh, robustness, uh, and insurance. Um, and the story I, that I like to tell is um, in the early days of AI, they would use AI to sort of automate people's jobs or sort of uh, create efficiency gains. Um, like you could use AI to make things 30% faster or 10% faster, 20% faster. Or if you used AI, you would, would, wouldn't need, you know, your offshore team and, and, and um, or near shore team. Uh, but it was quickly found that that's not really a good idea or a good reason to, to use AI. Uh, why? Because uh, you can never have a fully uh, automated AI system. Usually you need people in the loop. Uh, and then it turns out that if you save 10% of somebody's time, uh, that uh, you don't really realize that. So if you told me that uh, you're going to take 10% of my workload away, <laughs> I probably wouldn't notice it. Uh, what it usually ends up doing is you just do the rest of the 90% of the work uh, much better. Um, also, there's a lot of cases where uh, things were built, but because nobody had built them before, uh, once once they finished building them, they, they were faced with the reality of what AI does and can't do. And so that led to a lot of the specification error. There's also the robustness error where uh, there's huge challenges when things are built in labs and then they're kind of adapted to the environment. Um, and these AI systems just, or these ML systems just can't adapt quickly. And then the last one is, is kind of common. So the system could not be adequately monitored or controlled during operation. Uh, an example I, I like to give here that's a real life one is the example of, of Gmail. So for example, I think about 20 years ago, uh, Google had the foresight that if you can give free email, uh, then they can mine the data and they can create cool products out of it. And well, one of the things they did was they created the Lambda product. But then you said, well, why doesn't Google use more AI, say, for example, in their systems? Uh, and nowadays it does. Uh, and it does in sort of the format of auto-completing your sentences or giving you automatic replies. Um, what happened was they they actually did a really good job of building an AI system that can automatically write your emails. Uh, but the problem was it wasn't sort of assure, uh, you know, testable and the insurance was very difficult because if you have an AI system that can kind of write anything, uh, it cre created this, this risk that uh, the AI system might write something that might offend people or it might uh, you know, have an unintended consequence where somebody it might cause a conflict. And so what um, Google did when, and if you use Gmail, you would have seen this, is they actually sort of limited the responses to a bunch of canned responses. And then you can see this in your iPhone now where they take all the capability of AI and because they need to make it robust and assurable, uh, they actually pre can the responses. Um, it's sort of the same thing with Siri um, or these chatbots where a lot of the capabilities in these chatbots are, that are appearing now are the things that were showing, showing up in labs about seven, eight years ago. 
Uh, but the reason why it took so long for it to get in production is just because this, this challenge of making things robust and assure uh, makes it so the transition from the lab to production takes, takes quite a long time. Um, and this is sort of kind of to the point that we are trying to jump ahead. So there's already these um, frameworks that say, hey, let's measure the, the, the maturity of our AI models. We want to get to a place where they're mission ready, they're deployable, it's transformative, and it's used pervasively in business models. Um, but the challenge is, you know, it's easy to sort of make these uh, maturity models, but then we're all going to be walking hand in hand to try to get there. Um, and, and this is going to lead to like a couple questions from, from you is um, someone from the SEI wrote this document about how do you take software uh, and turn it into an engineering discipline? Uh, and there might be varying, varying degrees of, of thoughts on how much software engineering is a discipline like electrical engineering, for example. Uh, but there's this idea that you have to start from sort of the very left. You start as a craft, you start putting things in production, and then you start making money out of it, it turns into commerce. And because people are making money out of it, then you start training people. And then as you start training people, you have to turn it into a science and you teach these principles. And then once the science and the commerce turn into something that's very repeatable, um, something where you also have a lot of liability into it, then you sort of get this engineering discipline. Um, and, you know, a lot in a lot of my job, it's I'm, I'm thinking, well, is this a process that just has to play itself out or is there some way that we can accelerate this process? And I guess the question for this group, and I'd like to, to take like 30 minutes or even a minute to wait and hear what you have to think is, how do you accelerate the development of an engineering discipline? Like, is it something that just needs to take its time or is it something that you can sort of accelerate somehow? I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. And I'll, I'll give about a minute to, to, to see what the reactions are. So we can spend time on the tools, but the expertise just needs to needs to take its time. It's a good comment. <laughs> uh, someone mentioned uh, maybe AI can just figure this out for us. Yeah, I mean, um, that would sort of be this whole singularity idea. If we can get AI to build systems and then break them, um, that could be uh, that could be a thing. Just give a, a little bit more time to hear uh, additional additional thoughts. Incremental improvements and best practices. Yeah, that's where my head is going is, is if we can at least sort of figure out what the best practices are, teach them, have people sort of fail, then maybe we can close the loop faster and iterate faster. That's sort of where my head is going. I'll give just 10 more seconds if anybody else has uh, some last comments. And then it says, is that because tool development is repeatable or teachable? That's a good question. Um, I mean, I, I see that, and you know, um, you know, if, if you'd like to, to answer on the chat, you can. Um, I do see that because there's a huge amount of capital that, that, that used to be around. I guess it's sort of dying out now that there's a lot of people building tools to sort of meet unmet needs or potential unforeseen needs. Um, but a lot of a lot of the, the venture capital money is sort of forced uh, the tool issue because they're saying, well, I don't really, it's, I'm less interested about advancing the discipline of AI and more interested in making money of it, making money from that ecosystem. So 
part of me sees that's that what accelerates the, the tool development. Yeah, and then also we uh, we also don't agree what an engineer is. So um, I think most of us have engineering degrees. Um, but you know, if you say, well, what's an engineer? Um, I mean, the most uh, important thing I can point to is that you, I have a I have a degree that says it. And then I, I used to spend um, <laughs> my nights in labs learning how to do it. So that's sort of my comment on that. So um, what are we doing at the SEI? Well, we sort of are realizing how big of a, a challenge it is. Um, so um, me and my colleagues at the SEI sort of mapped out what do we need to do to build an AI engineering discipline. Uh, and you know, we just have a, a scattergram of looking at quality attributes. So quality is definitely, I think, the thing that sort of brings together engineering. So what are we trying to achieve? What are we designing for? Um, also within quality, we can think of cost. We also have people that are doing it. So people who are building AI systems, people who are practicing it, then people who are using tools. Then we have the people who are thinking about what people are doing. So we can look at it from an architecture lens, a design lens. Um, one thing that I think is really helpful for engineering is to uh, talk about failure modes and vulnerabilities, because that's when things get real and urgent. And then we look at testing, we look at workforce, we look at training, we look at processes. So uh, it's a broad field that we're looking at. Um, and, um, and then uh, some of you folks would say, well, um, these are things that have been done before in software engineering and systems engineering. And I'll pop up some slides to talk about that. Um, so one one example of a software engineering view of AI, um, you know, we at the SEI somehow somehow have these fun discussions of well, how much is, of AI is software and how much of it isn't. Uh, well, if you kind of take um, a software engineering view of things, you kind of look at requirements, architecture design, quality assurance, operations, teams and processes. Um, there is a ton of things I think that fall into software. And, and if you have some thoughts on how software engineering is AI or some aspects of software of AI that's not software engineering, uh, definitely type that in. Um, but there's definitely a lot of, of the software side of AI is, is covered well in software engineering. So um, I like to think of it as like, uh, the the implementation, how software is is code is is well done. Um, some things that I might point out that are difficult for software engineering to wrap their heads around is uh, the fact that AI is sort of meant to be in a continuously evolving thing that that's really hard to write requirements for. Uh, and then the fact that there's such a huge uh, dependency on data. So, I remember me and my colleague were chatting yesterday and we're talking about how uh, in some ways data is the requirement. So <clears throat> big changes in data means <clears throat> big changes in, in the requirements for an AI system. Um, and I guess one question, one comment that came, came out is that um, software engineering is a little bit more uh, math and science-y. Um, and that sort of leads to the systems engineering view. So um, I see systems engineering as, as looking like maybe one step up from this, kind of looking at the processes and the, the building blocks. So we see that we have sort of this um, proposed um, idea of how systems engineering, engineering can be used for AI by Lucas Fisher. And he talks about sort of the software system engineering lifecycle on the right and sort of overlapping it with the AI modeling cycle on the left. Um, and then, you know, I, I'm happy to, to hear some, some comments on this, whether you, you think this is a good one or not. Uh, but definitely where we are at now is uh, it looks easy when you write it like this, but then each of these blocks have a lot of work to do. So, you know, what does it mean to make a model? How do you publish a model? What do you need to publish a model? Uh, what is the right testing and evaluation methods? Um, these are all very open questions. So uh, say, for example, uh, one example I'll give you is, say, for example, you build a computer vision system or you, know, the, you can think of the self-driving car. 
And then you build this self-driving car in San Francisco. So it learns about hills, it learns about trolley cars, um, and it learns about the lines on the road. But then how do you know it's gonna work in countries where they don't have lines on the road, right? Or, you know, you have lines, but people don't respect them. Um, I mean, how do you how do you do that? I mean, do you do you have, do you capture that in requirements? Do you capture that in the model? Do you capture that in a different part of the system? Um, questions like these are are sort of the the big questions that we need to sort of iron out as an uh, through an engineering discipline. Um, and then the last part of the talk, I'll, I'll talk about specifically what we're doing in um, the software engineering division uh, in the AI side of the software engineering engineering institute. At, um, at Carnegie Mellon. Um, and so we recognize that it's a really broad space that we need to fill. Um, and we're gonna take a look at a few parts of it that we see are, are critically important. Um, so one part is human-centered, another one is scalable, uh, and then the other one is robust and secure. Uh, by talking about human-centered, um, I see that this whole model, or I, I believe personally that this model of let's just build more dashboards, let's sort of get better visualizations for the human and sort of have the human um, be embedded with the computer is, is one way of thinking about it. But I, I also think that using AI needs to make people happy and, and improve their work. So how do we, how do you not only try to figure out how the human and the AI can achieve their goals the fastest, but also how do you do it in a way that makes humans easy and, and uses humans for what humans are good for? So, so I think right now there's a lot of emphasis on humans are gonna take the risk and humans gonna accept the risk. Humans are gonna make the final decision, uh, but that's putting more and more pressure on the humans to not only do their job, but understand what the AI is doing, um, but can we think of other ways of teaming? Uh, scalable AI. So we we kind of define he, it here as scaling up and in and out. So how do you scale it uh, up? So large scale. How do you scale it out? So across the enterprise. So how do you build, um, say, commodity or um, uh, common platforms across the the uh, the enterprise? And then also down. So how do you build things into small embedded devices? And robust and secure is how do you make things reliably and how do you make things that are secure under threats? Um, I'll just give uh, a couple examples of each one uh, and then we're going to turn it over to questions. Um, so one example of trust is this idea of, uh, sorry, one example of human centered is this idea of trust. So I like, we like to say building trust requires a keen focus on the user. We need to understand their personal experiences, cur current context, and the available evidence of the system's capability and integrity. Um, the reason why I highlighted this now is um, when we tend to build AI systems, we tend to build it for the experts. So we tend to bring in, say, the best lawyers or the best procurement folks or the best underwriters into um, into like a small design team and they sort of build like expert level pro pro user tools. Um, but that usually ends up being a, a challenge because what sort of the best expert user can do is, is different from what sort of the, the usual worker can do, um, you know, given all the other demands that they have in their time. And so we end up over building one way towards over trusting or distrusting. Uh, and especially it's, it's this challenge where uh, of course, if, if the user knows exactly what the AI is doing, they can sort of not over trust, right? But how do you build systems where the user doesn't need to be an AI expert and they still have calibrated trust, which just means that they don't sort of just okay everything that comes out of the system, but they also don't distrust it, which is they just disable the AI and they just kind of do what they're gonna do. And so this is one of the key questions that we look at. Um, is how do we do calibrate trust, not too little trust, not too much trust. And just a quick note, this John Lee is a different John Lee. Um, <laughs> uh, unfortunately, not me. Um, another comment, another example is just scalable AI. So um, 
I think we're starting to hit the age of um, specialized ML hardware. So if most of you nowadays will have specialized ML hardware in your smartphones, um, so a lot of the image processing that's done in your smartphone now uses sort of the, the, the specialized chips. Uh, a lot of the specialized um, voice and, and translation stuff also uses the chips. Um, but this is just the beginning. So now um, regular CPUs are starting to get these capabilities. So um, the new uh, the newest uh, chips from the latest manufacturers have the ability to do uh, basic ML things. And um, and the, 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 the shift is that these ML operations are very regular. Um, so when you're doing a specific application of, say, uh, a large language model, uh, once you sort of configured what the data flow is going to look like, the processing is pretty regular. Um, as opposed to computers that need to be able to compute very dynamic um, things. And the other thing is the amount of computing processing, computing power that needs to be done. And so there's a lot of discussion on how many, how many, how much precision needs to be done in, in these chips. Like, do you, can you just do 16 or do you need 32 bit? Um, and then also how do you do these uh, very complex tensor, tensor, tensor uh, computation very quickly. And, um, you know, as they sort of flow down, um, for better or worse, and you can tell me whether you're worried or not, you know, imagine like your drones are going to be AI enabled, or could you imagine that in the future you can buy an AI enabled drone for 20 bucks? You know, imagine how things are going to change, how many different applications there is going to be. So it's, uh, this is the beginning, and then um, there's going to be a ton of different changes to how we see things implemented in hardware and these, these new platforms that are going to enable a lot of new applications. Um, and then the last area is, uh, or second to last is robust. So uh, we tend to have problems where we get these examples in training. So on the left side, we'll get a red car, a yellow car, and a white car. Uh, because usually what happens in, in our ML training and our ML building is that um, we tend to say, oh, I need pictures of cars. And then we kind of pick out these canonical pictures. It's like, oh, when I think of car, I think of like this red car and this this uh, Volkswagen Beetle and this white car, uh, you know, when you actually run it, you're like, well, I didn't think of this car that's on fire, or I didn't think of the blurry car, or I didn't think of this, uh, this Dodge Charger driving in the snow. Um, and so then the questions that we're looking at here, and I'll leave them as questions just so that it, it keeps it interesting, but if, you're, if you wanna know exactly what we're doing about it, we can talk about it later. You know, how do you build that models that would figure out how to do this. And then there's two ways you can think about it. So um, how do you build a model where if it gives you a picture that's completely never seen before, it'll either tell you that the confidence is low or it will just not classify. So that's one, one, one way of doing it. And the other way of thinking about it is how do you, how do you build a system so that when you try to do classification, it actually tells you how confident it is. So it'll tell you if it's 90% confident or 80% confident, or it's no confidence and it just kind of throws the problem back at you. Um, well, and then we have some questions in the chat. Um, I'm just like one slide away, so uh, I'll, I'll probably finish the, the talk uh, and then go back to them. But uh, for those of you who have questions, just feel free to drop them in the, in the chat and we can answer them. Um, and the last one is this whole idea of secure AI. Um, this one's kind of fascinating because this one's just going to take off on its own just because, um, you know, there's, it's sort of like cybersecurity where it's going to be driven by the threats and, and challenges. Um, so as we see the threats, we're just going to have to move forwards. Um, the one, one example that I'll talk about here that's really interesting is this whole idea that if you take a stop sign, and then you put little patches on them that, that somehow, if you put like a little uh, sticker on here, it turns it into a speed limit sign from the AI, uh, which is kind of weird, but uh, it makes sense. Um, and then, then the comment is, well, let's train the models so that they don't do that. So let's train them to be more robust, right? And then it turns out when you do that, um, 
it turns out that it makes it more successful, accessible to exfilling the models. So when you sort of build more robust things, you can actually figure out what the model has seen in its training data set. So this bottom example shows you a bunch of pictures that were used to train the model. Um, and then when you build things to be robust, you can actually exfil the model because by building things to be robust, my intuition is you're, you're, you're training a lot more of that information in the model. Um, and then there's also a trade-off between revealing the right thing and doing the right thing. Um, so, so that's kind of an interesting trade-off. And this is, this is one thing that I think is interesting from an engineering perspective. Uh, because when I think of engineering, I always think of trade-offs. I remember I used to have a professor that said no free lunch. And so if you're getting a free lunch, something's wrong. So here it's saying, well, I mean, you can learn to do the right thing uh, or if you can learn to do the wrong thing, but that's at the expense of, uh, you know, you, you can do it to learn the wrong thing. So you will make sure you don't reveal the right wrong thing. Cool. And so that's, that's kind of, um, my talk today, I guess we're, we're right on time too, right at the one o'clock mark. Um, and I think we have ample time for, for questions. Um, so feel free to type them in or, or Phil or Jack, I don't know if you wanna moderate them. Yeah, they can, they can type them in or they can raise their hand and just verbally ask them. Um, and I'll select based on when I see the hands go up. There are a couple in the chat already. And then I grabbed a couple from the spreadsheet. Um, of people saying why they were interested in the talk or questions they had. So I guess we'll, we could start with Kevin. Um, since Kevin had one in the chat, he typed in at 1 p.m. Um, and he's asking about divergence in hardware capable of learning versus applying um, already learned AI. Do you see a difference there? Yeah, there, there definitely is a difference. So um, it's a good, real, real good question. So there's a number of um, specialized uh, ML hardware manufacturers, um, and some of them will support training and some of them won't support training. Um, training is definitely a harder problem where um, not only do you have to sort of, um, you know, create uh, the, the, the explanation I was given was create the data flow. So create the, the deep learning architecture, uh, but you also have to update the weights. And then you also have to be able to update, or you also have to be able to support sort of these, these cool training things that happen. So renormalizing the weights, um, these concepts like dropout, um, supporting different types of, um, of, uh, of um, reconfiguring sort of the intention mechanisms and stuff. So the, the training is definitely a harder version of the problem. Um, in terms of divergence, um, I do I do see that there's there's a different market for just applying versus um, learning. So, say for example, in my case, well, maybe I don't see it yet, but I, I mostly have a, a need to apply the machine learning on my phone, but not a lot of need to um, to create it. Um, also, there's this problem where creating the machine learning takes a long time, so. There's not really going to be a lot of appetite for it now, but perhaps in the future it'll change. Um, just one, one story is I used to have a coworker who used to train machine learning models on his on his on his MacBook, and because of that, his his, his MacBook would basically turn into a hair dryer. I mean, it would just be spewing out the hot air, and then he had to mount it on the wall. But after about three months of doing that, his, his computer blew up. So, I mean, the the, the training the training problem is very very difficult. Thanks, John. Um, is there anyone else that wants to raise a hand um, for, for a question they have? Okay, so Kevin asked another question via chat. Um, do you know of any good papers on trust calibration? Ah, yeah. Um, I can, uh, if you, if you go into, uh, Google, uh, SCI, um, robust, secure, um, I'm, 
Uh, we have like a white paper on that, Secure and Robust AI, and there's tons of, tons of references there. Um, the, the basic breakdown of the, of the research is that um, you can either do it during training or you can do it after the fact. After the fact is more about just tuning the scores to, to match what the actual probabilities are like. Uh, so if you're a statistician, it just means taking like a frequentist approach uh, to binning the actual scores that come out and then mapping them in a statistically rigorous way to actual probabilities. Um, so that's one. And then you can also do it at, at, at training because depending on how you build the model, they can be more or less susceptible to calibration. Uh, and the general intuition that I give here is that when you're training the model, if you can sort of blend more of the data points so that you're not giving lots of little ones, but you can sort of blend them or make variations on them, it tends to make systems that end up being easier to calibrate in the end. Uh, but yeah, that's like a quick overview. Uh, and then we have a, a nice paper that Eric Keim and, and Ethan Van Hodness wrote um, uh, that has a lot of references in it. Um, okay. Um, any anyone else, or if if there aren't, then I'll fill with a gap with some that came from the spreadsheet. Okay. So so the 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 first question, John, that came from the spreadsheet was, how should our approach to engineering AI solutions be similar to and or different from? the way we approach traditional software development? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I, I, I'm not gonna give a very good answer for this, but I can kind of tell you the pain point um, I faced when, when we we're trying to solve this question. Um, so I used to have uh, two teams, one team that would sort of build the AI assets and then another team that would uh, build the software assets. So they would sort of take the data science assets and turn it into software assets. Um, and a lot of the mismatch was less about the different expectations. Uh, but what it was, was there's sort of this, this competing competing priorities thing where the data scientists always wanted to build models that would work in their use cases and in their data. And then the software engineers would say, well, we want pretty code that would generalize and then can be adapted to work on additional use cases. Um, and that, that mismatch, and this is something that some of, we, we also look at in SSD as well, uh, create this tension where they, we would get a ton of things that would come from the data scientists, but it would just never get productionized. Um, I was usually stuck in the middle of it, sort of being a little bit of a data scientist, a little software engineer, and just try to rewrite things myself. But it became a very difficult uh, situation. Um, so, so maybe rather than giving you an answer, I, I feel like the challenge is how do we make a software engineering process that is supportive of data scientists or, or kind, of, kind of works for what the data scientists will really produce? Because I feel like one of the challenges we have now is that um, because it's it's an evolving space, and I think somebody mentioned that they're virtuosos, that uh, if we create too high of a bar for data scientists, that uh, we just won't make anything. So how do we sort of maybe relax it in some places, and then how do we maybe ratchet it up in some places so that in the end, we still create reliable systems, um, but we, we we're able to accept the reality that our data scientists are not software engineers. Yeah, yeah that's good. I, you know, I, I might add a little bit to that answer, John, because yes. a lot, of, a lot of times when you know people were looking for AI to either semi-automate or automate decisions, you know, as part of a workflow, and so in in the engineering, because AI technology and what data scientists are using today is going to be so different in three years. I would want to design those workflows probably upfront where the decision points are and then have that where that can be integrated into the system so that it's interoperable 
you know what I mean? So that changes don't ripple through the rest of the system. That's traditional software engineering and something that I would want to do. And, and with AI, I think that would probably stay the same, um, at least, you know, from my mind as a system and software architect. Um, yeah. So that that's probably what I would add is that, that I think is the same because I think the technology is probably going to look so different in three years. And if I plan on my system being deployed for 10 or 15 years, you yeah. know, how do I how do I stop stop those changes from rippling through the rest of the system um, when I have that? You know, so that, that's something I would add. Then there, there's a second part to this question. Um, are there any industry specific guidelines we would need to take into consideration in the example they provide? is, you know, guardrails for healthcare specific use cases? Uh, good questions. Um, I, I understand that they're starting to build different regulations uh, around AI and fairness. I mean, the, the canonical cases are in, in the US, we have laws that um, are, say for example, apply to the insurance industry uh, around discrimination. Um, and then there's laws around housing. Uh, Singapore has like a responsible AI act. Um, I think Europe is drafting one. Um, I believe New York state has created one around fairness. Um, so, so it's starting to come that way. Um, industries, industries, as, as I understand it, are, are mostly, uh, other than the ones I mentioned, are, are mostly kind of tied by data and privacy issues. Um, and those are very, very uh, challenging. So the problem with data, AI is if you don't have data, you can't really make the models. So the fact that there's these regulations on privacy and data ownership um, are, are, are really big blockers in building um, AI. I might even say that if we, if we really didn't care about AI or privacy, I mean, we would probably be a lot further ahead than we are now. Um, just to give you a couple examples, so one is uh, that Codex thing uses data from GitHub, but it's still an open legal question of whether that's even entirely, um, you know, how does that work given that some of the data comes from open source projects that, um, you know, Microsoft and OpenAI doesn't own. Um, you have this idea of, you um, you know, the privacy that hits healthcare. So, you know, if you have these HIPAA requirements, say if you aggregate to a certain extent or if you do a certain amount of blending, then it's okay. But then what does that mean if you can use a model uh, and then sort of exfil the data? So by exfil, meaning if you use the data, if you use the model enough, uh, you can actually figure out who's in the model because it's one thing to hit, uh, you know, use the model once and get an aggregated statistic, but if you use it too many times, you could sort of pull that information out. Uh, so I guess, again, a really good question. I don't have a, a great answer. Um, I can just kind of share some of the things I've heard before. Yeah, that's good. You know, because when, when, when I look at that, I think about my, you know, my daughter just had surgery and you know, any, anything, you know, especially when you're, when you're dealing with kids, you know, and these things are being operationalized for the first time, I, I would want to make sure that it's, you know, again, like you said, John, well certified and, and verified that it's not going to cause her undue pain or increase her risk for application while they're, or um, complications while they're learning, you know, and adults, you know, an adult can sign off and say, hey, there are risk, this could make your outcome better using the AI, but you have, maybe some risks and they decide, yeah, sure, test on me, you know, but especially for children, I'd like to see those guardrails in place um, go, go, going forward because they can't really make that, you know, informed consent decision. So that's good. Um, okay, um, is there anyone else with a question? If not, I'll roll to another one. I have a, a two-part question, but if anybody wants to raise their hand or ask a question, um, let's see, there's three new messages down there. So I'm gonna scroll down to those just to see if I'm missing anything. Okay. Um, yeah, Richard from from BAH. Um, he's asking, how does training avoid biases of the trainer? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's a real good question. Um, in my experience, I find that the person training the system is usually not the person that's uh, collecting the data. 
Um, so I might, I might extend the question and say, how does uh, training avoid the biases of the person collecting the data? Or how does the, the data avoid the biases of um, the people that helped annotate the data? Um, it brings me back to an example where we were doing uh, work for uh, the financial industry. So we're doing one of the big financial regulatory implementations. Uh, and we're building an AI system that can sort of um, review, uh, review uh, financial documents and then provide answers. And then we would train it. And then as we trained it, we used data sets that had data from one person that would review the documents and data set from another person that would review the documents. And we would get into these situations where we can never get, the, the, the AI would just get stuck. So the AI would get better and better and then just get stuck. And then we could fix it for one example, but then it would fail for another example. And when we saw that, we would realize that there's biases in the people that are creating the data. And so that would be the limiter. Um, I, I used to like to say, if your training data is only 95% accurate, then you're never gonna build a 98% accurate model. Or a more common example is in sentiment analysis. So people will only agree on sentiment, whether something is good or bad or funny or not funny, like 70% or 60% of the time. And so there's a lot of bias in what is positive, what is negative, what's funny, what's not funny. Uh, so just kind of going back to the question, um, I feel like a lot of it is, is the bias is coming from the sourcing of the data. Um, and usually the best way to, and, and there's no golden rule on, on how do you avoid that? You just have to sort of iterate and, 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 and kind of be thoughtful about it. So, uh, a lot of times the sourcing of the training data is sort of an afterthought, but, uh, the more I, I, you know, sort of got into the job and the more we sort of learned about it. The sourcing of the data actually became one of the, the more strategic parts of the project, because uh, if you can source the data well, then the rest of the project will kind of go. Uh, if you don't source the data well and there's biases in it, then there's going to be a lot of looping, a lot of why is this, a lot of why isn't the AI getting better, a lot of why is the AI sort of oscillating and inconsistent, and a lot of um, AI spitting out results and then the person disagreeing. Uh, that was also a killer because if somebody, if you, the AI spit out results and they disagree, then you have to go all the way back, change, look at all your data, uh, redo the data, and then train it again. Uh, that, that would happen a lot of times. Yeah, John, I see that being like there's two, two types of biases. One that you're not really aware of yeah. that you're injecting in there, and then also intentional. I want this AI to give me certain results to influence something you know how would you how would you catch like from a security perspective that intentional bias where someone's looking to you know engineer an outcome yeah um real good question real good point uh phil i mean i i always just kind of look at testing uh i'm a little bit biased uh i believe in sort of we used to use the okr method so setting objectives and key key results uh and then having the testing pull that out by having sort of all the right people in a room, figuring out how this is going to be tested, figure out what the data is going to be like, uh, making sure that the, the success criteria are, are well-defined. Um, I used to do it like that. Um, the other way to do it is also using like a responsible AI framework. So we've published a responsible AI framework with DIU, which uh, gives sort of a, a nice process and uh, a reasoning criteria of how do you build things so that these things don't come in? And I guess to, in that process or in that framework, they they mentioned that you need to bring in the, the people that will be affected by the AI. So they're saying, well, if you bring in the people that are going to be affected, the people that the AI is going to matter, um, and then bring them into the process, then it should be caught. Um, so a little bit hand wavy. Um, but I, I think this is still a little bit of an open problem as well. All right. Any other questions? If not, I'll roll to the to the other one from the from the spreadsheet. And then if there are no other questions, we'll we'll wrap it up. Okay. Let me scroll up here. Okay. So this one's kind of a two parter as well, John. 
Um, what are some of the most wicked AI problems related to decision making? Wicked AI problems with related to decision making. Mm. I mean, I can I can give you some fun uh, philosophical ethical ones. Um, I mean, you definitely have the one with the self driving cars. Um, that imagine you roll out self driving cars, and you know statistically, if we were to guess, um, it will decrease the amount of deaths on the road. Um, but you know. Do we are we able to enable uh, machine decision making so that we can make that happen? So um, would we rather, you know, have less deaths? Um, but when the deaths happen, it's because the computers, you know, malfunctioned or there is an AI error versus, you know, saying, well, we would have, we would end up having more deaths, but then it's because uh, humans were involved and then there's a reason for it. So, so that's that's one one crack at it, and then another one that I, I think of a lot is imagine that you have humans uh, making a decision in a very critical environment. So it, we can we can exa imagine an example uh, that you see in movies, right? So imagine some contrived example where there's a bomb that's going to go off, and the bomb's going to take down a whole building. And the, the human is trying to decide what to do. So do you cut the blue wire or red wire? And the clock is ticking down. And then you can think, well, I'm going to use my, and imagine this is the future where you have your AI bot, right? And the AI bot, you know, you scan the bomb and then the bomb and, and the AI bot says, cut the right, right red wire. And it says 85% accurate or 85% confident. You know, what do you do with that information, right? It's like, well, I mean, I'm going to make a life changing decision. My AI says it's 85% accurate. Do I disregard it? Do I, do I use my gut feel? Um, so, I mean, those are a couple examples of, of decision making that, that AI, which uh, apparently raised more questions. Um, but I, I, I think that's where the space we are now, where we need to think about these things and try to try to figure out what we're comfortable with. Um, I don't know, Phil, what do you think? You, you have a thought on that so, one? Yeah, so for me, it kind of blows my mind, this whole machines making decisions, especially like in the DOD context where we work. Okay, we're going to put ordinance on a target based on something a computer tells me. And then me as a colonel or, or a, a one-star general has to look at that and it has to be explained to me. And then I have to say, okay, well then, you know, you explained it to me and the explainability was good today, but yeah. then what if information changes and the enemy wants to make it look like that? So I blow off a mosque or a school um, because they find that out and that continually staying ahead of that where I'm comfortable allowing a machine to do something like that. And so some of the use cases are simple, right? Base defense. If there's a bunch of things flying over the base and you have assets that are expensive and you want to protect, then you, you might trust that, you know, to, to, you know, say, okay, you're going to blow up things that look like drones and that's low risk, but then shooting into a city. So that kind of thing. And then even in the health healthcare field that people brought up, you know, so I'm a surgeon and you're telling me that, you know, during a surgery, I have to cut the bone three millimeters more than my eyes are telling me. And do I trust the machine or do I trust my eyes? You know, and what what do I do? And probably judgment, you know, it's probably judgment, Th those type of things. I think that explainability and getting me to trust that and staying ahead of that so I keep trusting it, especially when you know, I go read a magazine and I know enough about AI and ML to be dangerous and people are talking about drift or, you know, people spoofing data. And then I'm like, can I really trust this? What if somebody spoofs the data? What if there's drift? You know, that that kind of thing and staying ahead of that to me seems like a wicked problem that is constantly going to need to be reworked. Yeah, definitely. And that's a lot of what we're researching now is uh, I feel like the tools aren't there right now. I mean, they're sort of there. You can do a little bit of explainability. But ideally, in that case of the, the general, right, I'd, I'd want to be able to ask the AI, prove it. Or why do you think so? Right. Or, or something like that, which shows me, well, 
what information are you using? In the same day that if you asked a human, they would tell you, well, why do you think so? Or, or what grounds it? Um, I, I think that there's a lot of research to be done there. And that, that's something that I'm excited and, and optimistic for. Okay, and then there's just one last half of this question that's they're asking, you know, what are some of the unintended consequences of altered reality that you've seen? Altered reality? Oh, you like deep fakes and stuff? Um, yeah, I think any 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 anything like that. I, and I don't know if they they mean like like a if they're meaning VR or something like that. But yeah, I guess I guess there are, you know, the altered reality. I mean, I, I guess it could backfire if you get caught, but I'm not sure. Um, that was. Uh, let me look in the spreadsheet and see if if they're still here and who that was from. It was Eileen Arnold? I'm not sure if she's still here. No, I, mean, I can kind of guess. Um, I, I, I guess one thing that was interesting was yesterday I was on a panel with someone um, from SEI, and or we were doing a talk on deep fakes. And, and, you know, we're, we're talking about, well, in the future, are deep fakes going to get too good where we can't tell? And, and the researcher, her name was Shannon, said, yeah, I mean, definitely. And then I said, well, what are we going to do about it? And she says, well, right now, um, the, the resolution on these deep fakes is not so good. So if you have high resolution, you can tell it's a deep fake. Um, she also said, if you put your hand in front of your face or kind of turn your head, you can turn it, tell it's a deep fake. Um, so she said, and also she said, it's really hard to create deep fakes in real time, um, with, uh, with high resolution. So that's going to be difficult. Um, but then, then, you know, we we're talking about it later. She's, I, I asked, Hey, so it's just going to get to a point where the deep fakes are going to be too good. And she said, yeah. And basically for me, we, we, as humans, our, our best sense is, is our vision, right? So. Uh, we verify things, we do trust, we use our vision to do a lot of things. But I mean, if if this visual sort of capability of ours ends up being, um, you know, uh, elusive or, or misleading in, in the digital space, I, mean, I, <laughs> I can't imagine, I can't imagine these things showing up in, in real life uh, until we get these, you know, real life holographic images. Uh, but definitely, I think it's going to change how we trust things in the digital space. I, I imagine we're going to have to stop relying on on just our visuals and probably rely on other things like certificates or um, something else. Okay, great. Um, we have, well, we're at time, but I guess I'll leave it open. Is there anybody with a last question for, for John? Okay, it looked like a couple of messages. I'm going to scroll down just to see. Okay. Um, there's one last question. Is there any type of data tagging techniques that can be implemented to rely on the integrity of, of video? And yeah, that, that makes sense to me too. That's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting where uh, on, the, on the flip side, usually when you use these um, uh, deep fake things uh, that, that are available or, or provided by software providers, they'll put watermarks in it. Uh, so just a heads up for you, you folks that that are, are creating deep fakes or, or these uh, elusive videos that a lot of times the watermarks are embedded in the images. Uh, so if you're kind of savvy, you can read those. Um, I, I do imagine that these things around uh, like certificates or trust are, need to be start embedded into uh, images. So, you know, you can imagine that in the future when you generate an image, it also has your, uh, you know, your, your certificate in it or your key. Um, but that's more hypothetical. Um, I don't know, Phil, if you know the answer to that, um, if they're doing something around that. So, I, I mean, I've read some stuff and I'm, I'm not, I'm not an expert, but they were talking about new sources that they're, they're, they're going to release videos out there and they're, and they're going to have some type of checksum or something like that. Um, you know, so that, that it can be verified that it came from CNN or, you know, I don't want to say Fox News and have people beat me up here, um, but but any 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 news source that you deem reputable, where it comes you know directly from them and it's tagged so that you can always go and get the authoritative source of that video, so it's not spliced. Because I've seen some where they've done them with, 
you know, President Obama and you would think he was Donald Trump um, when, you know, you watch his videos and you're like, wow. Um, and now I didn't inspect them, you know, thoroughly and blow them up and everything to see how fake they were. But when you see, you would think he had views that he never, you know, he wouldn't, he wouldn't espouse um, and talk in a way that he wouldn't. But anytime there's so much footage of you out there, um, you know, that makes it easier and easier for them to do that to those people that are in the public eye all the time. And maybe for me, where there's, you know, 10, 10 Google videos of me talking about system and software architecture out there, you know, it'd be much harder maybe to create the, the deep fake, um, you know, maybe my ugly, maybe, maybe cause I wear these ugly shirts all the time. Um, so it'd be a little harder, but, uh, and anyhow that, yeah, that's, that's an interesting, interesting question. Um, but I think that's how you would do it is you would have to have that there to show this is the whole unedited video. Um, and, and that can be verified. Okay, well, I'd like to thank everyone um, for, for attending. And remember, we will not have one in December. Um, we'll have a little bit of a break, and then we'll come back in the third Wednesday of January, and we'll have uh, Dr. Yasser to talk about DevSecOps, and we'll plan some, some future ones. I have some iron in the fires, but I don't have firm commitment for February, uh, March, and April yet, but I will by the time that, that time comes around. And, John, thank you so much for your time and your willingness to, to do this. Um, and thank, thank you all for your time.